Welcome to the Real Estate Investing Podcast, where we help you unlock your potential freedom through land investing, real estate investing, and entrepreneurship. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Real Estate Investing Podcast. My name is Ron Epke, your host. Today, I'm very excited to have Eric Shiraga on as a guest. He's an expert in land notes, seller financing, everything around that. Um, before we get into the show, I'm going to go over a quick Discord question. When selling a piece of land, what is your number one piece of advice? And this is from Jennifer. Um, really good question, Jennifer. My biggest thing is you want to get in front of as many eyes as possible. I have so many people ask me, like, should I post on Craigslist? Should I post on Facebook if it's over X dollars? Like, yes, post everywhere. Um, that is getting in front of more eyes. Post in Facebook groups. Get in front of as many eyes of potential buyers as possible. And those people can those people are on Facebook. Those people are looking on Craigslist for deals. So that is my number one piece of advice. Um, but there's that question. Let's get into the show. Like I said, I have Eric Shiraga on as a guest. He's an expert in seller financing, he has a great background in land notes, everything around that. Um, Eric, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Ron. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Uh, let's just first get into your background. Like before you got into like, how did you get into land, uh, financing, seller financing, land notes, all of this, what's your background, uh, before that? Well, I have a long real estate background. Um, I was a teacher for 23 years, high school teacher. And, um, in 2003, I started flipping homes and doing buy and hold investing. I completely burned out on that. Uh, didn't want to do that anymore. Too many headaches with landlording. In 2016, I came across note investing based on a podcast on bigger pockets. And I started researching that. I met someone who kind of mentored me through the business, and we were purchasing um, defaulted junior lien residential mortgage loans. And so I learned the default space and the individual state laws through that. Um, I did that until uh, about COVID hit, and then the residential uh, mortgage market kind of, you know, it became tough because the interest rates in the secondary market were so low, it was just very difficult to get any yield. So I had a friend in that space who recommended that I should research the land space. I did. Um, I thought, what an awesome opportunity for seller finance. And I've met um, just a ton of great people in the land space and I just really like it because there's just an immense opportunity in any market for investors to sell their land faster and for more money. And if they're originating their seller financing um, loans correctly, um, they can sell those loans at any time very easily and with minimal discount. Nice. That's really cool. That's a good back. I had no idea you're a teacher. I only lasted one year uh, teaching. I taught high school for one year. I'm like, this is not for me. I don't want to do this for the kids. <laughs> it's a tough job. It's a very, very tough job. Yeah, they they deserve their three months off. Everyone says like, oh, you're only going to work nine months. Like they, they deserve their three months off. No doubt about that. Um, but uh, yeah, let's get into it. Like I said to you before we uh, started, before I hit record, like I'm educating myself right now on seller financing quite a bit. Um, it's not something we currently really educate our students, our members on, because I want to feel comfortable. I want to do five, 10 deals myself with seller financing before I start teaching, before I start telling people and having experts like you on is going to be very helpful. But um, if someone is like looking to get into seller financing, like what's the first thing you would tell them? What's the first piece of advice you would tell them? So the first thing that I want to disclose is that I am not an attorney, CPA, or financial advisor, and I recommend that before anyone take any steps in their business, they consult with the appropriate parties. I am just providing uh, my own experience as a note investor and someone who has been involved in seller finance transactions. But um, to get started, I would say that the first thing that they need to do is purchase high quality land. If they're doing that, um, they will have no problem selling it with seller financing because in my experience, they're going to probably get three to four times the interest as just selling it for cash. Because as I like to say, you know, most people don't have a hundred thousand dollars laying around that they want to spend on acquiring a piece of property, but most people do have $20,000 that they can put down in a down payment and they can make payments over a you know eight to ten year term. 
And it, as long as you're originating the loan the correct way, you really have a great opportunity to move uh, lo- uh, move your land faster and for more money and really create a great instrument that's going to provide you a lot of value. So like these people, and I think that's the stigma around seller financing um, is it's always going to be $40 a month payments on $3,000 land. And that's what I'm kind of being educated from you on is like, no, we, we can do this on $100,000 properties. I think the key being, and explain this a little more, Eric, is this is not something where this is a land contract. This is something where they're going to have a mortgage essentially, correct? And then they can build, they can do all this stuff with land contracts. A lot of times, guys, those are restricted where you can't, until that loan is paid off, you can't do anything really with that land except sitting on it. Um, where this is what Eric is talking about. Like you can do things on this land. An end buyer can do stuff on the land if you originate the loan correctly. Correct, Eric? Correct. So my first piece of advice is that I do not even recommend seller financing for deals under 25000 I feel like those should be cash deals. And if someone doesn't have that type of money, they probably shouldn't be buying the land in the first place. And second of all, I am not a fan of land contracts for many reasons, probably 10 different reasons. Um, And, you know, I think that it's just much easier to sell the land, going through title, having the title transfer into the buyer's name at the closing, and then retain a note and mortgage that allows you to foreclose in case of any default. But as long as you're, you know, as long as you're doing the correct checks, when you um, originate the loan, you really shouldn't have any problems. But I think where people make mistakes is that, you know, they feel like they have to sell the land and they have to lower their standards through, you know, no interest, no money down, no credit checks. And that's really the opposite of what I do. I believe that you should be checking credit because that's the best indicator of performance. You should be getting as large a down payment as you can, and you definitely should be um, uh, charging interest. Now, I believe that the reason that people do not charge interest is because they don't want to have to provide a 1098 at the end of the year to the borrower. And a lot of people feel like they have to self-service these loans, but you really don't. I always have a professional servicer collect the payments. They provide a ton of value. And it costs about twenty to twenty-five dollars per month, but that cost is going to be paid by the buyer, the borrower, and it takes all of that work completely off of your plate. You're not going to have to talk to borrowers. You're not going to have to check on payments. You may have to handle any, and you have to do your own bookkeeping, but you don't have to handle any statements at the end of the year. You don't take calls. It's totally outsourced. Nice. That's really cool. Um... And yeah, I think, like I said, like that's just a lot of people talking about seller financing are talking about those land contracts. Let's take a couple steps back and just like, what is the difference? What is making a land contract uh, not ideal in your situation? Like what, what are the legalities? Obviously, you're not a lawyer or anything like that. Um, but what are the issues with land contracts that you see? Well, first of all, it's a harder sell because you're going to have to explain to the buyer that they're not going to receive the deed to the property until they pay off the entire contract. So what happens to you and what if what if you're not able to provide the deed to them at the end of the contract? The other issue is that states are beginning to crack down on these and they see them increasingly as predatory. And so they're enacting more and more state laws that require in some states a memorandum to be recorded. The other issue is that in Florida, for example, Florida requires a foreclosure Um, for any installment agreement that involves real estate. So in Florida, if you do a land contract, you're still going to foreclose it and you're going to have to file foreclosure in case of a default anyway. The other issue is that the property remains in your name, so you have the risk of ownership. So if there's an accident on the property and someone's injured, you're going to be sued as the owner, regardless of what you put in your contract. So you're going to have to have liability insurance that covers you that the buyer pays for. The other major issue is that land contracts are very difficult to sell. They're pretty painful. I've done it before. I no longer do it just because you're not just selling the loan. You have to deed the property, and that brings up 
title issues, that brings up transfer tax issues. They're just very difficult to do. So if you do want to sell it, let's say you know, you're trying to expand your business, you're trying to raise capital, it's going to be very difficult to sell. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, we had a uh, we had a property where we bought, and then we found out someone was living on our property, and he's claiming there's a land contract, and then he's like claiming the contract was stolen, nothing was recorded. I'm like, I I'm sorry for the situation, but like that's the reality of it, and that's like my thoughts with land contracts, especially a lot of old school land contracts. I feel like they're not recorded. They're on a napkin. Uh, they're on a piece of paper. Both people are holding it. They have a photocopy of it. Whatever it is. And those aren't going to hold up in court if that orig- if the person holding the contract uh, sells the land or does whatever. Um, like it's just because they're still on the deed, they can sell the land or they can do all this stuff. And then this uh, land contract, the actual contracts are just nowhere to be found. And if they do go to court, they're not going to be held up. Is that something you see a lot? I think there's so many old school like contracts like that out there. So what I see frequently is that people are using kind of boilerplate land contracts which may have individual state issues. Um, So, you know, I feel like in a lot of states, the whole land contract concept is kind of murky. There are not established state laws for them, which puts you at risk because if you do have a dispute, you do have an issue, and you go in front of a judge, you're at the mercy of what that judge decides about that case. I know that nobody likes foreclosure, but foreclosure in many states in which land investors do business it's it's really a relatively fast process um it's non-judicial it's not that expensive it's not that long and the best part about it is that it's a very specific prescribed process that you follow in order to schedule a sale in which you will either get paid in full or you will get the deed to the property back and you'll get clear title. With land contracts, once you record a memorandum of agreement, you've clouded the title, which means that if you do have an issue and you do need to take the property back, you're gonna have to essentially file a foreclosure anyway in order to clear that title to be able to resell the property. The other risk is that if you do have a buyer that defaults, that's paid for several years, and you terminate their contract, the only thing they have to do realistically is go to an attorney, file a lien on the property, and you're in trouble because you can't resell it, which means you're going to have to litigate to clear that lien. Oh, that's really interesting. So if someone's looking to get into seller financing with the correct way, do it all the correct way, like how do you how do you go about or how do you recommend going about qualifying a buyer? Because obviously you don't want just anyone on a eight year mortgage with you um, because you don't want them to default. Ideally, they don't default. I think that's the best case scenario is you don't have to go through foreclosure. So what kind of buyers are you seeing that are paying eight years, 10 years um, and not having to be foreclosed on? Yeah. So this is actually the procedure that I recommend. And I recommend a very simple, uh, straightforward procedure in all cases. You don't need to be an expert in this. So First, I recommend that you just advertise your property with a couple keywords. The first is seller will finance, and the second is owner financing available. And those are important because, especially on the MLS, a lot of people do keyword searches, and your property will pop right up. Um, I don't recommend that you put any terms in the listing, and that's because not everyone will qualify for the terms that you may advertise. If you have someone with a really low credit score, you're going to want a much larger down payment. And if you only advertise a 20% down payment, that's going to put you in a bad position with that potential buyer. So when people call in, I recommend that you ask them two questions. Do you have 20% down and how's your credit? And based on their answers to that, you will know whether this is someone that you want to move forward with. Um, I always recommend that you obtain a copy of the buyer's credit report. Now, I realize that not everyone has access to credit, but what I recommend is that you just tell, that you just request from the buyer that they obtain a copy of their credit report through one of the online portals. There's many of them out there that will provide one free copy of a credit report per year, and at least you can see their score. Um, I recommend that. 
for me personally, my cutoff for 20% down is a 680 credit score. Below 680, I'm actually going to be looking for a larger down payment because the down payment should always be connected to the risk associated with the with the borrower. And you know, regarding credit, you have to understand that there are billions and billions of dollars of loans originated every year that are based on credit scoring. It is the best predictor of default that we have out there. And that is why it's so important. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. And it's how I kind of, when I'm doing, when I'm selling with cash, when I'm selling with uh, bank financing, whatever it is, like I want to hire earnest money, higher down payment, essentially a high, higher deposit for people that I view as more risky that might not close on the deal. And sometimes I want a termination fee if where there is uh, maybe even before their due diligence is over, they have a thousand dollar termination fee and all these like credit checks along the way. If they do accept these terms, they're more likely to. And I think that's the same thing. Like if someone puts 35%, 40% down on something because they have a 600 credit score for you, like they're definitely more likely than if they only put 20% down, they're more likely to complete the life of the loan. Um, let's say someone doesn't want to, like someone in our community wants to offer this or something like that, but they don't want to hold the loan for eight, 10 years. You mentioned selling notes. How does that look like? What does that look like? So if I'm trying to sell a property for a hundred thousand dollars, um, and I want to offer seller financing, but I hear about you, I hear about people who are buying notes. What does that look like, um, from our member, our student who is trying to sell like this? So I have a program that I developed to purchase uh, seller finance land notes at closing from note invest from land investors who want to be able to offer seller financing but don't want to hold the note. Um, and it's been quite popular so far. It's really a win for for the land investor, for the buyer, and for myself as a note investor. Nice, that's really cool. Can you? Uh, so, what are your kind of? What do you buy the notes for? So, if I sell something for a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, and you're saying, let's say they have a 700 credit score, I get 20% down. So they're, the cost of the loan is $80,000 after closing. I sold the property for $100,000. Um, what does that look for? Like, what are you offering me as the land investor? Yeah, so uh, my program is very straightforward. It's designed so that the investor always receives 80% of the sale price at closing. So uh, if you're selling a property for $100,000 with seller financing, you will always receive the 80% 80, 80 of that or $80,000 at the closing. Now I know nobody wants to take less uh, on a finance deal. So this is how I explain that. Um, what I recommend is that people actually sell for a maximum of 10% over their cash price if they're financing it. And in my experience, buyers are perfectly fine with that, paying a little more for the luxury of paying the loan off over time. So I recommend 110% of your cash price if you're financing. And then in my experience in this market, if your list price is $100,000, a cash buyer coming in, they're, they're going to typically say, well, I want a discount tonight. I'm only going to pay 90% or I'm only going to pay 80% because I'm a cash buyer. So there you go. There's your difference right there. Um, seller financing will allow you to sell for more money and really uh, create great terms for the buyer and for yourself. So there, the, the loss there is really non-existent. In that type of situation, you're gonna be receiving the same amount of money, whether you sell for cash with a discount or seller financing with a premium. Yeah, and that's kind of, like a lot of people in our community talk about seller financing, holding the notes. Like if you're doing this correctly, you're gonna get 10, 11% or so per year. If you're an active land investor, I think selling the notes makes way more sense than holding the notes for eight years, where it's your business model to hold the notes. Um, it's our business model to turn cash fast. And by having someone buy your note, it just makes more sense to me than trying to hold a note for eight years and overlapping that with the rest of your business. Um, but let, let's go walk back and say that someone does want to hold a note, whatever they want, 11%, 12%, whatever it is, and they want to hold a note for eight years, 10 years. What, uh, you talked about some softwares or some programs that, uh, manage that and collect the payments. What do you have some recommendations for that? Like for whatever that's called, I don't know what those systems are called. 
So I always outsource the collection of all payments yep. and all interactions with the borrower to a licensed loan servicer. I think that's some of the best money that you will spend in seller finance because they will do everything for you. I highly, highly discourage people from managing or servicing their own loans. It's not worth the time and the effort. And the best part about this is that the $20 a month or $25 a month that the servicer is going to charge you for that loan, you can just add into the cost of a loan and the buyer is going to pay that. So it's not going to cost you anything and you're outsourcing all of that work, including the tax documents, collection of payments, uh, statements, monthly statements to the borrower. Uh, everything is outsourced. Is it is the initial mortgage or deed of trust or whatever it's held in, is that outsourced as well? Or how does that like, that's what makes me nervous is like state by state, things change, documents change, you want to make sure you're doing things correctly. How is that outsourced as well? So what I recommend for that is have the title company provide the loan documents. Because every single title company has a legal department. And if you tell them, that you have a, uh, it's called a purchase money mortgage, your seller financing this, and that you need the loan documents, they will always provide those to you. They are state specific, their attorneys are gonna prepare them. And the best part about this is that you are going to receive a closing, what's called a lender title policy, which ensures that you have a, a first lien position on this property. It's essentially an insurance policy from the title company. So the title company is not going to give you um, documents that they know are incorrect if they're insuring your loan. So it's a really great um, situation to be in to just outsource to them. And you know you can have a lawyer in the state do it, but I just I just defer to the title company, and they usually do a great job, and it's ready for the closing. And the other great thing is that they're going to charge you about five hundred dollars for that. And so I just add a line item on the HUD that is a uh, loan fee or doc fee, and I just add that cost onto the closing statement. So you're not you you get all these additional services, and it seems like the borrower is paying for everything. Um, Correct. So, so that's it. So you have someone collecting payments. You have someone doing all of this. What uh like what kind of volume in terms of that are in terms of note buying are you doing currently and how many do how many notes do you try to hold at once or is there like or do you just keep on buying them so i keep on buying them um i typically don't sell the loans you know my business is is purchasing land notes so you know my goal at the beginning of the year was to buy one note per week so right now i'm purchasing about 1 to 2 per week Nice. So you're, you're growing for sure. And, uh, and you said eight to 10 years is normal. Is that correct? So with my program, the max term is eight years and the max per sales price is 200,000 above 200,000. I recommend that you take that deal to a bank because the payments are going to be likely too high for the buyer over eight years. They're going to be looking at like $2,000 a month payments. So that's better served by a bank. But what I see is that below about 200,000 or 150,000, banks don't want to do those loans. They're not worth the time and effort and cost for them. So that's a great um, option for land investors to sell or finance those loans. So your kind of bulk of your work is 25 to like 150,000, you would say? I, that's pretty yep. widespread, but... Okay. Yeah. And under 25, you're not doing anything, correct? No, I feel like under 25,000, those should be cash purchases. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people do land contracts for those sizes, but um, I try not to purchase land contracts anymore. I'm just focused on the traditional loans. Interesting. What, how do you see like this market affecting, or maybe like someone it's enhancing businesses of someone who might maybe, a, maybe took on seller finance or something in terms of a land investor who is struggling to sell properties, anything like that. Um, how do you see this market when we're in a minor or major recession, whatever you want to call this a recession? Um, uh, how do you see this market affecting that or the ability to sell? So I really believe that this is an awesome option in any market. 
And if you change your listings to offer seller financing, you will see a huge increase in the interest level just because it's going to provide you with a with a buyer pool that wasn't available before. And I think that people can't, you know, people in an uncertain economy, they don't want to spend all of their cash on purchasing a parcel of land. But for them, the finance option is much more realistic. And if you're getting a large down payment, you're essentially doing the best you can to ensure that your buyer is not going to default. And if they do default, you have a relatively low investment to value. So if you do have to take the property back, you feel comfortable about reselling it and still profiting. Makes sense. Um, I just had a question come to mind. I'm sure it would be helpful as well to viewers um, or listeners. What, uh, so what happens when a realtor is selling it? Is it they get that percent of, so if you bought a loan at closing for 80%, we, let's, let's keep that $100,000 number. It's very simple. A realtor is taking 10%, 6%. Let's just say 10% because that's, again, an easier number. You buy the loan for $80,000. Is that realtor getting 10% of $100,000, correct? Correct. So it, seller finance does not affect the commission. You still have sold the property for $100,000, so they're going to charge you the 10% of the $100,000, and you're still going to pay them. Do you know anything about loan? Like, do realtors sell properties on notes in terms of not necessarily if you're selling a note at closing, um, but how does that work? Um, I've, I've had people ask me that, and I really have no clue um, in terms of, like, let's say you want to offer owner financing, or maybe a, pro a realtor can't sell a property, and you want to tell them, like, I want to offer owner financing. How does that look with a realtor if you are going to hold the note, or is there no way? So my experience with realtors is that over the years, they develop a very fixed mindset about how things should be done, and they do not want to hear anything outside of their like little box of like their procedure. So sometimes they can be resistant, and, it, and it's probably because they don't understand it. But what you need to explain to them is this property is going to sell a lot faster I'm going to handle the, the underwriting of the loan. You're not going to have to do that. You're still going to earn the same commission. It's going to be the exact same situation, except we're going to sell this property faster. It may take a little education, but in my experience, you know, some may be resistant, but the more savvy realtors who are doing a lot of deals and are familiar with land are going to be more open to it. And they're going to understand what's going on in the procedure. Some I've worked with, actually, they're like, yeah, that's a great idea for that and I know exactly how to you know process this with the um, buyer and the buyer's agent the one caveat I will say is that sometimes realtors they just love to negotiate everything every last line item and it goes on forever you know and I feel like it they give the impression to their client like they're working hard for them but it just gets painful. You, the contract's going back and forth and back and forth and they want to negotiate everything. And I just, you know, I would discourage you from that. I would just kind of like say like, this is what I'm offering because in so many markets, seller finance is such a luxury and nobody else is offering it. So everybody, you know, if you're in an, a market in which there's other properties available, everybody's going to be running over to your listing because you're offering the financing. So, you know, I would not get in those ongoing forever negotiations about every single little term yeah realtors are uh i had a realtor probably a couple of weeks ago and i was trying to find a realtor in an area and they told me they don't post on the mls i'm like we're, like that's the value you bring is posting on the mls um a lot of times some of these like uh, i don't try to white tail these companies don't post on the mls and the main reason is i'm 95 percent sure the main reason is they want 100 percent of the commission and when they post on land.com and they can wait six, nine months, and that's not our business model is waiting six, nine months, but then they get 10%, they get a hundred percent of 10% instead of 50% of 10% when another realtor comes in, which 99% of the time when you post on the MOS, it's going to be another realtor who comes in, who's represented because those are realtors who are seeing it. Um, but uh, any last things you want to tell our viewers in terms of seller finance, you gave a ton of great tidbits and in this, um, any last advice for land investors in our community? Yeah, let me, um, let's see. Um, make sure that you get a title policy at closing. That's the first one. And you just request that from your title agent. 
Don't lose your original note. You want to keep that in a very safe place. Um, let's see. You know, I, I'm happy to. There's some. There's some. Um, there's a few tidbits here and there. But if anyone has any questions and wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to provide. You know, advice or answer any questions that they might have. Um, of course, they need to seek out the appropriate legal. Um, uh, opinions and, and professional advice uh, in that state, but I'm happy to advise them based on my experience as a note investor. And also, I put together a video that's best practices for seller financing land based on my experience and how I do it. So, um, you know, they can they can consult that too. Nice. I really appreciate that, Eric. And uh... Eric is in our Discord, Eric Shiraga in our Discord. Um, I'll link it uh, at the bottom of this uh, description for this video, for this podcast, wherever you guys are listening. So again, I really appreciate you coming on, Eric. Um, again, thanks guys for listening to this episode. Um, if you guys have any questions for Eric, like I said, he's in our Discord server, which I will link below. Um, other than that, thank you and uh, have a good day, guys. As always, thank you for joining. Please do us a huge favor and like and subscribe our YouTube channel and share this with a friend. It really means the world to Ron and I. But more importantly, it could help change the life of someone else. Thanks for joining and we'll see you next episode.